Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. I have a bit of uh, work experience in Africa and a bit of that hopefully will help in today's podcast discussions. Um, and I've tried to understand through my time how diverse, is beautiful and different the challenges in each region is. And hopefully that can lead to more uh, engaging discussion today. Yeah, and I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a background in research in international relations. And we are from Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Yeah, Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we create a world that is not just sustainable, but one that thrives. Uh, before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia and, and First Nations people across the world. Um, so today we're talking about survivability in the African context, but thinking about it from a mental health and well-being perspective. We would like to introduce today's guest. Emmanuel is a Ghanaian national who has lived and in Ghana, Togo and Nigeria in West Africa. He has a Bachelor of Business Administration and Master's in ICT Education. He is passionate about sustainability and believes that education can be a great way of empowering communities and fostering positive change. Emmanuel's combination of academic expertise, cultural awareness and his dedication to leveraging education for community empowerment reflects a broader vision for a more inclusive and sustainable future in West Africa and beyond. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, an insightful discussion. Maybe, Mike, you could kind of shed light about how we look at mental health from uh, you know, a broader Western perspective, and then maybe we could understand where we are today uh, in the African context. Yeah, thanks, Kavya. Yeah, I think uh, it's yeah good to important to look at it from obviously globally. There, there are different approaches, and in the West, we obviously seem to have more of an individualistic um, approach to it. But there are obvious factors, and uh, many studies have highlighted these, um, such as uh, things like um, exposure to natural areas like uh, green spaces and green cities. They actually increase. Uh, mental well-being and mental health outcomes and there, there are things like community engagement um, things like that being connected to uh, and you know socially can, can increase this there's a lot of um, uh, social isolation in the west and uh, due to that individualistic uh, focus and often not enough uh, work-life balance uh, lots of financial uh, incentives for many but um, a lot of let's say uh, disconnect from the natural world and I think, um, you know, this can obviously affect and undermine mental well-being and mental health. Um, I think uh, the World Health Organization highlighted that it was something like 12 or 13% of people globally have a mental illness or a neurodevelopmental disorder. And there are obviously a whole range of different factors that um, influence this and affect this. Uh, I think yeah, another factor connected to, you know, disconnect from the natural world today in the developed world is, is things like the media and social media. And that can, there have been many studies uh, showing some links to uh, having a negative impact on mental well-being in that regard. And um, obviously there are other factors too uh, connected to things like um, uh, exposure to things like trauma, obviously has a, a, and social deprivation has links to not so much mental illness, but another aspect of mental well-being, which is connected to neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, other things like brain, brain injury through trauma, but um, definitely mental illness and mental health issues can uh, arise from many experiences, uh, ranging from childhood, ranging to, to many issues, uh, maltreatment and so forth, whether it's domestically or within the workplace, um, you know, even in adult, adulthood, as well as obviously a whole range of genetic uh, factors. But it would be interesting to know um, how this approach uh, within the West uh, developed world, how this approach and understanding and the causes and the, let's say, public perception and cultural viewpoints, how they differ from uh, other parts of the developing world, and obviously within this context, how that differs from the uh, African context. So I'd be interested to hear Emmanuel's uh, take on that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, from the African uh, perspective, it's a little bit different, obviously, from the West, due to one, uh, poverty is a major cause of uh, the 
mental health issues. Okay. It is like a constant burden on your mind if you're always looking forward to uh, how your life is going to be tomorrow, what you're going to be doing, how you're going to try to survive. It is always a stress. And almost everybody's mind. Because the standard of living is uh, relatively lower, so it puts a lot of strain on the mind. And then uh, the same with, uh, well, uh, other issues in terms of uh, genetic issues that make people prone to mental health issues. It is also the same, you know, because we are also the same human beings. People can't have certain things to be prone to that. Then um, people, I think also some of the causes include, uh, for most people that are actually in the psychiatric hospitals now is because of they've suffered some traumatic experience, uh, loss of a loved one, uh, breakdown of a relationship, you know, very traumatic experience that they went through recently. And then uh, quite recently, we've seen a rise in mental health issues due to drug abuse or, or drug uh, misuse. And it is kind of increasing these uh, uh, instances and cases of mental health issues uh, all over the country or all over the sub-region too. But the issues are not treated on an individual basis. People tend to rely more on their, on their communities Obviously, your f- their family is the first form of support. And then uh, from the government point of view, there's little to no help there because the public health system barely can accommodate the uh, health, uh, uh, health issues that are actually life-threatening to now come and focus on mental health issues. So families kind of have to fund or support their uh, loved ones if they have any form of mental health issue that requires treatment. And then for those that cannot afford that, it means that they have no help. So you kind of see the, them wandering around the streets and then uh, uh, with nobody to uh, provide any form of support or any form of uh, health care. Yeah, and maybe I could add in, like, from coming from an Indian perspective, because I grew up most of my life in India, is that there are, while I think what we're talking about, there are mental health issues and there are mental illnesses but there is stigma in india as well in terms of how these are addressed firstly i don't think most people acknowledge that there is an issue uh that that's the first problem because it comes across as they're weak there is a there is a perception that if you cannot deal with uh you know a stress you can't deal with the fact that you have to struggle and work hard or uh, that you've had you know some kind of family or trauma crisis that you're just weak so that perception kind of stops people from openly expressing that there are issues and it usually goes under the surface. And I think in, in that context, what happens in India is that families are not really well aware that there are issues and they usually don't seek help outside. So it comes down to the individual to find other avenues and a lot of it is, I guess, social media, like it happens in the Western world or they would try, if they have enough money, probably call and find a therapist, but it all happens in private. Um, so I, I don't know if there are such similar um, stigmas or issues in the African context. Yeah. The, speaking of the stigma, it is similar here too, you know, uh, because you are expected to come out as strong enough to be, handle, be able to handle your own burdens. So there isn't really the culture of speaking up uh, about the issues that you are currently facing through. It is, there, there is a very, a very funny recent incident where a man attempted to kill himself and then uh, it was unsuccessful because somebody came to uh, meet him in the process. And then it was immediately arrested and put into a jail cell for attempted uh, murder on his own self. You know, there's somebody that is going through uh, an enormous uh, burden of, and then he's thinking of killing himself. But then what do we do? We rather arrest him and put him in jail cell. The first thought is not to provide some psychological uh, work to get him to see a clinical psychologist you now. And then... Uh, People, people, people kind of shame on him that you are a man with wife and children. This world you resort to killing yourself instead of actually working hard. So the stigma is the same here too, even for those that are actually having mental breakdowns. For those that are having their disorders themselves that are actually erratic or they are more reactive to the way they behave, they behave in a more reactive way. People tend to shy away from them because of the perceptions of uh, uh, the people being either possessed or have some form of uh, deformity that is uh, not wanted in the society, you know, because of uh, 
uh, not understanding how the mental health issues uh, work or how people may be suffering from a condition in the brain that will lead them to behave in an adapting to it. I think that's a really uh, interesting point, um, as Emmanuel had discussed. I just wanted to, um, before going back to that, actually, just, just in the Western context, um, just note that even, even the stigma surrounding, or let's say not so much stigma, but um, lack of education regarding mental illness and other things like neurodevelopmental disorders are existent within the West as well um, in, in a completely different context in that, um, that when you think about it, wealth people, obviously the, the Western world, wealthy developed countries, there is still that, uh, let's say, uh, economic um inequality and uh, there are there is social disadvantage so there are obviously people who are wealthy but there is obviously um people within any western country who uh let's say face a whole range of uh, social or economic uh, disadvantage compared to say the wealthier even if they are a minority then and that can be linked to many things and can exacerbate and cause many things connected to uh, mental illness illness substance abuse but also uh, can magnify and and cause things like child maltreatment and growing up uh, with things like trauma, uh, abuse and things like that. And obviously one of the impacts of that is that uh, if someone has uh, something like uh, neurodevelopmental disorders or mental illness, that it can cause issues and in some cases uh, can be detrimental, uh, have a sort of domino effect of, of influence in one's life. And one of the, another study that was interesting uh, highlighted how there's a disproportionate uh, uh, percentage of people with um, neurodevelopmental disorders who end up in prison in the West. So uh, in countries like America um, and, and Australia and so forth, where uh, this that much uh, uh, of the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders can be environmentally shaped through things like trauma and social deprivation. And whereas a someone who had the luxury of being... Uh, uh, not socially deprived or economically disadvantaged or not exposed to trauma as they were growing up may not therefore make the same choices as someone who has that had those experiences and who may, let's say, have a wrong run in with the law, commit crimes that a, a mentally stable person or someone without a neurodevelopmental disorder might uh, might do. So they someone who is mentally stable uh, is unlikely to commit such crimes, but there's a, this extra level of, let's say, uh, community or cultural penalisation or lack of understanding of people who are in a pre-existent sense, let's say, vulnerable and who didn't get the support that they needed uh, early on and in many cases, uh, you know, let down. But there's that kind of, there's a lack of education and some level of stigma. And I think things like social media can peddle that as well, sort of a, a deliberate, let's say, ignorance regarding uh, supporting people who are struggling mentally uh, uh, with you know psychiatric uh, conditions, and uh, y y this can basically, yeah, link to you know sensationalist approaches, and you know it's it's an easy way to demonise people uh, who who let's say commit a crime. In many cases, this is due to pre-existent uh, mental uh, mental health and neuro neurodevelopmental uh, disorder issues. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd again be interested to see. Um, how that does con contrast in it with Africa, as uh, as Emmanuel indicated, but yeah, it's interesting to see how that uh, exists in the West as well. Yeah, you know how uh, somebody commits a crime and then pleads uh, insanity or temporary insanity to issues that may have contributed into actually committing the crime. It doesn't exist here. Uh, most of the time, these folks uh, do not even get legal presentation and uh, stay on remand for years before getting into the court because of the. Uh, judicial system that we have here is purely uh, poorly developed. If you decide to take your loved one to a, a mental health facility, it is extremely overcrowded uh, with no support. You radically have to be funding your loved one in the government facility uh, as to their medications, as to the conditions of sleeping. So uh, uh, really public support, uh, government support for uh, public health on the uh, uh, those who are suffering from health conditions, uh, mental health conditions, is non-existent. See? So people rather resort to, and this is this is for those who are really have the money and want to be able to support their loved ones. Uh, the conditions that are so poor, you know, and then you, unless you have the money to engage the services of a 
uh, of a private health facility, then that you may have a better chance. But most fo- most folks really do not even think of taking a person to uh, a health facility to do something like this. We, there are a lot of people who are in prison now that ordinarily would not be in prison for the crime that they committed because of uh, because of the condition they are going through. Somebody steals a bag of rice and gets ten years in prison. This person is just going through a lot, you know, trying to get something to steal. It is not armed robbery, just theft, you know, uh, or a shoplifting, and then gets a last sentence. You, but the underlying factor there is the poverty, and then the, so you may, can imagine the stress that a person is going through in wondering what to eat next. So that is that is the way it is here. All of this is underlying, underlying uh, uh, poverty, underlying it. Uh, all these issues that we currently have from the African point of view. Uh, somebody loses a job and then uh, is unable, it gets looked down on in the society. So he will resort to alcohol abuse to try and then block his mind from constantly thinking about the issues that he's facing. There is a BBC documentary on uh, abuse of codeine in, some, in, in Ghana and then some part in Zimbabwe too because, and then in these interviews we hear the folks saying, we have no work, we have no money, can't take care of our children. So when we take these drugs, we fall high and then we forget all our problems, you know. And then not everybody is able to recover from the uh, the 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 dose the the, the 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 drugs that they take and then some of them actually lose their money and they're unable to become part of society again, even if they stop abusing the drugs. So it's a it's a very large and complex cycle of issues that contribute to uh, mental health disorders, and then com- uh, co- uh, uh, combined with the inab- in a, uh, unavailability of uh, health facilities to actually treat and cater to people that actually suffer from these in- 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 uh, uh, cases, make it worse. Yeah, and I think in the context of how in the society you get treated, we did speak about quite a few stigmas that stop you know uh, people from expressing. Um, I wonder, like, on a day-to-day basis, how prevalent is it to see people with mental illnesses around? Uh, it could even be people, I mean, you know, for example, children, uh, you know, we know that they have mental health issues or they are being taken to, say, using public transport to go to a doctor with the family or somebody on the street who looks like they might be, you know, um, alcohol or drug abused uh, and hence, you know, suffering some issues. So this is something that I have seen very different from, say, living in India than living in Australia and other places. There's a lot more, lot less openness for people to take uh, their children or take anybody in their family outside, except in their, you know, guarded cars and point A to point B and not be exposed to society. Um, I wonder if uh, that's a similar case on how are people treated in a, in a public context? Because I think that also has another impact. If I went, left the house and walked up the street in a few hundred meters, I'm guaranteed to see one person. I actually know where, I can actually point to you where there's somebody lying on the street, you know, practically naked without any form of clothing. And then you, obviously this person is suffering from some form of mental health disorder. You know? And when you think of it, this is a person that has a family was carried by a woman nine months, you know, has a family. Somebody dedicated their life to this person for at least five years, you know. Uh, and then this, the person that's left to waste away because no one is able to help. There's no government institution that is tasked with moving around and uh, finding people that look like they may need help, you know, and actually offering to help them because of funding issues and because of support. And then the families themselves have practically given up. So. The stigma themselves, uh, people do not want to even associate with families that have a history of uh, one, one or two people having uh, a form of a mental health disorder. You will be one to marry into a family that has an instance of something like this because the, it is considered something that is tabooistic, you know, uh, because some some attributed to spiritual causes. So... That's the that's the way the stigma works around here. Not just this, but mental health, um, but uh, other forms of uh, disabilities and uh, uh, disease uh, infections that people may contract, including HIV. So it kind of compounds the issues around how people are stigmatized. People basically avoid uh, making any form of contact with people that they suspect to uh, 
have mentality disorder. Yeah, I find that really interesting how, yeah, I think in the, in the West, say, let's say people who have a physical disability, as far as I've, I've noticed anyway, a physical or disability, there is obviously, or, uh, or illness, let's say, uh, there's a lot of uh, understanding and care, but um, that's not necessarily extended to the same extent to people who have mental or psychiatric conditions in the same way, uh, especially if they aren't acutely going through an episode, if, if someone seems to have some kind of issue. But it sounds as though, yeah, Emmanuel, you're, uh, it's interesting if um, uh, people who, let's say, uh, have other conditions which are even, say, connected to physical or other, other health issues, that there still is some level of uh, cultural stigma connected to that, which is um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, not just uh, mental health. Um, uh, usually HIV, uh, uh, someone with the sub uh, just lying on the screen. Uh, the compassion is not there. Uh, if, if somebody wants to show compassion to just say, drop a few bucks to get something to eat, uh, and it's more of a nuisance to actually go out of your way because people think of it as a nuisance because you don't want to make any home of contact uh, with, 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 the, with the kind of person. And I think that stems from the lack of education or awareness, you know, uh, and then strong beliefs to the causes of such conditions. People may, somebody may say it's because they did something bad in their past life that they have to suffer such ordeal in their present life. Somebody may say they did something bad that someone has cursed them, placed a curse or uh, a bad omen on them for them to be going through this. So if you want to go your way out, uh, go out of your way to show compassion, you may likely incur that wrath on your own self. So people just to be saved, uh, will want to shy away from such a person uh, who is suffering from such a condition. Um, think of uh, autism uh, among children, you know, uh, AGND, uh, paranoia, schizophrenia, you know, people tend to shy away from this because they do not understand uh, that this is actually a mental condition that can be diagnosed, treated with medications that can improve the conditions that the people are having at the moment. Uh, without that understanding, People resort to other ludicrous ways of interpreting the way the world or uh, things that are happening around them are, and then that is also a huge contributing factor to uh, uh, the way they react to such instances of uh, uh, health and their mental health disorders. Yeah, and and I think thinking of like solutions of what uh, what the society can do, but also what individuals can do. I think we've been alluding to the fact that there needs to be more education awareness. Uh, provided, I guess, by institutions, government, and as well as uh, at, some, at some level, society groups, if, if we could. Um, what else do you think that somebody as an individual could do and as policies that are happening? And do you see any positive uh, you know, improvements in the recent past? We know that you know, as, as the newer generation comes, they are a little more aware about the fact that there are issues uh, and are ready to acknowledge them. So... What kind of solutions do do you guys think we could propose? Or right, I could just start maybe with uh, just a Western, you know, perspective. Maybe um, you know, within the Australian context, even um, I'll be interested to hear what Emmanuel um, mentions regarding the African context. But you know, I think education broadly and just people being um, open to understanding the uh, conditions of, of mental well being. There's a lot of um, and you see it in social media, for example, there's a lot of intent to stigmatize other people. There's a lot of demonizing of people. Uh, it's sort of part of human nature. And I think when there's a, let's say, education is one aspect, but on an individual level, it's perhaps being you know, less judgmental and understanding that um, there are conditions, there are factors that uh, are behind people's actions. And in some cases, with someone... Uh, uh, commit something that uh, or, you know is, is desperate enough to resort to something which will get them into trouble. Uh, there, there has to be some underlying reason for that. In that you know that they may be suffering a mental health uh, issue, and there may be other causes behind that. So I think being less judgmental, less intent uh, intent to demonise people, and having more of uh, that can be part of it with education to create more of a you know mental uh, me greater mental well being within. Uh, any community within society and hopefully that can uh, filter into uh, our policy changes uh, ultimately. But yeah, I, I think um, the African context, I'd, I'd uh, be interested to hear what Emmanuel thinks. So I believe that we, aside the personal uh, document, uh, 
being judgmental about people who suffer from these conditions. Policy should be more focused on breaking down outmoded cultural beliefs uh, because they do not really serve the interests of anyone at all. Because everyone could easily be uh, a victim of such an instance. Uh, you could easily become disabled uh, in our highly industrialized world. You could easily suffer from a mental breakdown. Uh, in fact, most people are actually suffer from it, suffer from it to some degree. Maybe not as severe as people that may be roaming the street are, but uh, breaking down the uh, cultural structures that uh, uh, promote these uh, beliefs is the first step because uh, it is not like people do not show compassion for people who are suffering this. Uh, there is a belief that uh, what they may be suffering may be either spiritual. So uh, police should be clear to on that. Uh, think of it that there is a, a witch camp where the elderly will have to be uh, taken to when... Uh, 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 they kind of suffer from dementia or any uh, health issues that can cut that stem from old age, you know, in this country is, is appalling because uh, in the West, uh, I know you would rather be taken to uh, a, 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 an elderly home, you know, to get uh, professional help, you know, to try and manage the instant that cannot be cured. But here they simply brand you as a witch and then take you to a uh, 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 which camp you know where you are never there to practically die and then uh, move on to your next work. So the solution should be educative enough to break down the cultural uh, stereotypes that we have of people that suffer from uh, any health or mental health condition. And then we are, there is progress that has been made. People are showing more compassion in these days, especially through social media. You kind of see GoFundMe's and then uh, uh, calls for uh, support for people that are suffering from these issues. Um, and then, uh, so there is more, people are becoming more receptive because uh, the education around this topic is improving compared to 10 or 20 years ago. And so I think uh, we are in the right direction and then to just enhance the education. Eventually, I'm sure we will get to a point where people are more accommodating of uh, the unfortunate circumstances that people find themselves in with mental health disorder. Yeah, and I think one of the things that might be useful is uh, finding if there are resources that people can access that's more contextual. You know, we do know there are online resources today uh, that individuals who do feel like they need support can go find out. Uh, and a lot of them comes to sometimes celebrities who are able to promote uh, but I, I feel like when you actually need to speak to somebody uh, about it and finding a professional and finding a professional who might be slightly more aware about your context or your um, you know, mental health issues would probably be something that's worth pursuing. And I've seen that to be something that's useful, for example, in India, where there was not as much public uh, you know, resources, but you had enough professionals who could then be resources that were shared uh, broadly with everybody to access and call and find out which ones were free, which ones were paid. You know, I feel like moving towards that, especially as individuals uh, and those who are more, more tech savvy and are able to create these resources was, was one direction we could take. Yeah, Mike, you wanted to add anything else before we probably have to wrap up? I think uh, social media can be a very detrimental, but like you said, um, it, there are it, it is good when there are online resources and if only... Um, the, the more positive influences and resources for anyone who is struggling are made more available. That's probably one avenue to to help mitigate that. So, yeah, using online platforms for the good would would be it would be a good thing. And maybe uh, social media platforms could be uh, called in to be more responsible in that regard, perhaps uh, to at least uh, assist uh, to give people um, uh, access to support uh, uh, structure uh, support information as needed. But yeah, that's probably uh, that might be a good thing. On the broader picture in Africa, yeah, we could uh, improve our public health system. That will make people that will make it more uh, easier for people to become more trustful of the system in terms of helping the other people dealing with whatever uh, health condition or mental health condition they're having at the moment. I think we trust in the and then uh, the unreliable health sector contributes to this. Uh, people are rather resort to. Uh, praying or finding out that traditional spiritual way of uh, uh, caring or helping the other ones when they suffered uh, uh, from a health condition. That could otherwise be easily be 
sought by uh, you know getting the person on a uh, medication and treatment. So improving the health conditions and uh, the health setter is also a key thing that could be focused on to achieve this goal. Yeah, absolutely. I think adding it into a health framework rather than uh, making it a separate you know conversation in society could could be a direction. Um, yeah, I think that's the positive signs that there are uh, you know progresses being made, and I hope there's more local resources as well being developed. We know it's it's a big continent with lots of languages, lots of cultures. So for people to reach out to the right people to get support, we hope there's more local resources being built. Even the smallest thing that somebody can do and share the stories is still, I think, a lot more empowering than most people think it is. Yeah, I just want to uh, maybe conclude today saying that there, it is a growing uh, area of concern globally, and especially in the African countries, I think we are finding much lesser studies and resources that give us clear information. So that also might be a direction we might need to take, but there are resources available and uh, using the internet in, in the right way to find those would probably be a great direction for us to go forward. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Emmanuel, for really joining us and being able to explain the context and the issues that, that you have seen. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, Kavya. Stay tuned and keep on thriving.